Thanks to Third Love for supporting Mueller, she wrote, special report. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone, so right now they're offering our listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash report to find yours today. So to be clear, Mr. Trump has no financial relationships with any Russian oligarchs. That, that's what he said. I, I, that's what I said. That's obviously what the, the, our position is. I'm not aware of uh, any of those activities. I have been called a surrogate at a time or two in that campaign, and I didn't have not have communications with the Russians. What do I have to get involved with Putin for? I have nothing to do with Putin. I've never spoken to him. I don't know anything about him other than he will respect me. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. So, it is political. You're a communist. No, Mr. Green. Communism is just a red herring. Like all members of the oldest profession, I'm a capitalist. Hello and welcome to Mueller, She Wrote. This is part six of our ongoing special coverage of the Mueller Report. And today we're going to be covering volume one, section four, subsections five and six about the June 9th, 2016 Trump Tower meeting and the events at the Republican National Convention, pages 110 through 129. I am your host, A.G., and with me as always are Jaleesa Johnson. Hello. And Jordan Coburn. Hello. And this is, of course, I just want to remind everyone, the Department of Justice's redacted version as the full report has not yet been released to the public. So in case, you know, you're listening to this 20 years from now and, and going, why are there all these redactions? <laughs> yeah, we'll go back and redo the entire thing again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're wondering why there's redactions too, guys. Yeah. 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 yeah we feel you. So uh, let's start on page 110. And this is the introduction to the section on the June Trump uh, Tower meeting. And it opens with the statement that senior Trump campaign officials met in Trump Tower with a Russian lawyer expecting to receive dirt on Hillary Clinton from the Russian government. Uh, The meeting was proposed to Trump Jr. by Rob Goldstone, who we've always said sounds like a Bond villain. So (laughs) we often sing his name, Goldstone, thanks to Jesse Egan, a prior guest. Uh, So, you know, this was proposed to Jr. by Goldstone at the request of his client, Emin Agalarov. That's the son of Russian real estate developer, developer, Eris Agalarov. And uh, Goldstone told Jr. that the crown prosecutor of Russia, which isn't a thing, offered documents that would incriminate Clinton and her dealings with Russia as part of the Russian government's support of the Trump campaign. Uh, And as we know, Junior replied, if it's what you say, I love it, especially later in the summer. And so they arranged the meeting, basically. We we all know this. This is all kind of... We've, it's out there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's way out there. We've been through this in public reporting and in our podcast as well. So then Junior invited Manafort and Kush to the meeting. And according to Mueller, members of the campaign discussed the meeting before it took place. Cohen recalled telling Trump about the meeting without mentioning Russia. But according to the written answers by Trump, he has no memory of learning about the meeting. And Mueller found no documentary evidence showing Trump was made aware of the meeting or its Russian connection before it happened. Note that it says documentary evidence. Okay, because you have Cohen's testimony there. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And also there could be something besides documentary evidence like voicemail evidence or phone evidence or, or, you know, maybe I'm reading too much into it and there's no evidence. But he clarifies that it's no documentary evidence uh, where he doesn't do that in other you know, parts of the report. Yeah, that probably matters then. Yeah. So uh, there's always some weird word before the word evidence in the report. There's not there was insufficient evidence. There was not documentary evidence. We were unable to find evidence, you know, instead of there's no evidence, which it rarely says. There's a couple of cases. Uh, and, you know, we, we will point that out as they happen. So Mueller then names Veselnitskaya and how she worked for the Russian government and claimed that funds obtained from illegal activities in Russia were given to Hillary and to other Democrats. When Junior asked for the proof, she didn't have it and pivoted to the conversation or she pivoted the conversation to her bread and butter, which is overturning the Magnitsky Act. She was hired by the Russian government a long time ago to to pretty much uh, lobby against the Magnitsky Act and also got Dana Rohrabacher involved in it, uh, who we beat here in California. He's no longer a, a congressman. Yeah. But I think people have joked around that he's been paid by Putin. Right. Yeah. But I don't know that they were joking. Uh, I think we go over that in episode 17, if you want to go back and check it out. Uh, it's a Vander Zwan indictment uh, episode off the top of my head. Uh, Junior said 
that uh, uh, the Magnitsky Act could be revisited when his dad was president and left it at that. Veselnitskaya tried to follow up, but the transition team did not engage. And him asking that question, or not asking that question, sorry, him saying that, that we can revisit that, that's fine yeah. for him to have said. Yes. I think people think that that has some level of criminality tied to it, and it does what about not. the Logan Act? That wouldn't apply here? No. Okay. Uh, well, no. I don't think so. I mean, it would, but... When I say people, I mean people that are not, like, legal experts. Mm-hmm. Just the sound of it being, like, you know, we can talk about this and revisit some sort of something that could maybe be related to a quid pro quo situation, but it's not, and that's definitely not sufficient evidence to establish any of that sort of intent. Right. The The evidence here, I would think, would be that Junior said he, uh, when he... Um, asked for the proof of the dirt on Hillary. That yeah. Too, yeah. That, that's the thing where he's actually looking for um, an in-kind Co- campaign, campaign contribution, contribution yeah. from a foreign entity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and later on in the declination and indictment decisions, uh, Mueller will go over why Junior was not indicted for that, mm-hmm. for wanting it, for conspiring to get it, for asking for it. Uh, and even, you know, because we've all said a million times, whether you get the information or not isn't the law. It's it's whether you sought it out or conspired mm-hmm. to, to do so. I wish that he had said, we can revisit talking about uh, the Magnitsky Act once you give me the proof. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would I, be incriminating. I wish she said that. That, yeah, that would, would be, be amazing. different. Maybe it's just not smart enough. Yeah. So then that's the intro, and, and then it gets into the details. So mo- in most of this, we know, like I said, from our own reporting and other public reporting on the matter. So we get to sub subsection A, underpants A. Uh, it's about setting up the meeting, and it includes the outreach to Junior and the awareness of the meeting within the campaign. And this section opens with an explanation of who Eris Agalarov is. He's a Russian real estate developer, president of the Crocus Group. Take me down to Crocus <laughs> City, which is uh, one of the developers... That Sater and Cohen worked with, tried to work with, to build Trump Tower Moscow. I think they ended up with IC experts instead. Yeah. Um, But he, yeah, so this guy has ties to Putin, other members of the Russian government, including the prosecutor general, Yur Chaika, who might have been who Rob Goldstone was calling the crown prosecutor of Russia, because that's (laughs) not a thing (laughs) that Russia has. Uh, the Crocus Group holds multiple substantial Russian government contracts and worked with Trump on 20, the 2013 Miss Universe pageant as well. Mm-hmm. So it's probably why they looked, Sater and Cohen looked to them to do Trump Tower Moscow. And mm-hmm. and now this is part of the outreach to set up the Trump Tower meeting in June and of didn't, uh, 2016. Didn't Eris' son perform at that? Yes. Uh, Emin Agalarov. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Trump appeared in one of his videos mm-hmm. as well. One of his music <laughs> videos. Because I guess... Hot young people were in short supply. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for music videos. Uh, so June 3rd, right? The meeting's June 9th. Now we're on June 3rd. Uh, Emin, his son, called Goldstone. Goldstone, incidentally, facilitated an invitation that Trump sent to Putin to attend the 2013 Miss Universe pageant. That's why Goldstone's kind of the go-between here. Uh, then there are some redacted bits here for grand jury materials, followed by the words, Goldstone understood, redacted, a Russian political connection, and Emin indicated the attorney was a prosecutor. So it seems like they're talking about Veselnitskaya here. Mm -hmm. Uh, So because it's grand jury material, they've removed it, even though we know it's Veselnitskaya. Goldstone recalled at this point that the information that might interest the Trumps involved Hillary Clinton, and then the rest of that sentence is redacted, followed by another redacted sentence. And the footnotes here reference grand jury materials connected to a 302 on Goldstone taken February 8th, 2018. So after Mueller was appointed. Also uh, referenced are 302s from someone named Shugart. Uh, this isn't in the report yet, but Paula Shugart was the head of the 2013 Miss Universe pageant. And the FBI interviewed her in September of 2017. There are also references to a 302 from Kavaladze from November of 2017 and an email from Rona Graf to Goldstone. And usually when there's an email from Rona Graf, it's an email from Trump uh, because Trump yeah. doesn't send emails. Right. He'll, he, she'll print them out. He'll write on them with marker and she'll fax it back to them. Is that real? <laughs> yeah, that's how they do shit. Holy shit. <laughs> uh, real. Uh, yeah. And the, yet they made fun of the Dems yesterday in the debate for having hot mics. OK. Yeah. I loved your tweet about that. <laughs> About how Trump doesn't know how to operate an umbrella, but yeah. he wants to talk shit about technical yeah. difficulties. Trump Jr. tweeted today something along the lines of, uh, you know, oh, it's, can you imagine these people can't even get technical 
yeah. difficulties. And I thought it was Trump him? himself, too. Did they both tweet? That's yeah, a, Junior yeah. did. Can, mm-hmm. can you imagine any of these idiots in the war room if they can't operate te- <laughs> these technical <laughs> issues? And I was like... I said, dial it down, dick face. Yeah, they yeah. need some um, icy hot for that stretch they're doing there. That's a reach. <laughs> your dad can't operate an umbrella. That was my tweet. That was my yeah. reply. Trump, uh, Trump's live tweeting, though, I have to say, it was kind of comedic gold in the worst <sighs> way possible. Definitely. When he goes, boring. boring. <laughs> Somebody like, said, make so politics boring again. For the wrong reasons. I know, and I said, yeah. <laughs> I replied something like, you sound like a fraternity pledge who's yes. been forced to listen to NPR. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Boring. Yeah, I, th- I couldn't tell if that i was like wait that can't be his real account i mean can't of course i can believe he's fucking ridiculous but i thought that it was the parody account of donald trump doing that because it's it's so perfect it's so hilarious. it's such a hilariously ridiculous thing to say <laughs> boring <laughs> there's no sexual assault there's no treason yeah. boring yeah no murder no <laughs> lies no drama yeah yeah mm-hmm. i realized that now we're gonna have the rare experience of seeing his tweets from the perspective of someone that already holds the office looking down on the other the race to get him out it's gonna oh. be yeah it's gonna get weird did you see that there's a news story today that there his uh, any world leaders uh tweets will be flagged if they break twitter tos if they you know mm. they're you know their terms, terms of service, service violations mm-hmm. they'll flag them they'll they won't take the tweet down uh, and they won't put him in Twitter jail like us regular people. It's just another privilege thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, they will flag it or somehow label it like, uh, w- this is violates our TOS. Mm. Oh, my <laughs> okay. gosh. Cool. <laughs> Big step. Yeah, thanks, Twitter. Mm. So uh, at these footnotes, there's also uh, call records from Goldstone noted here. Uh, there's an email from Goldstone to Junior et al., uh, there's a 302 from Benny Amanoff, a low-profile real estate executive turned pop star manager who knew about the dirt on Hillary. And then there's more. It's not in the report. I'm just telling you who he is. And then there's more emails to go uh, to uh, to and from Graf Goldstone and Shugart from back in 2013 that were about Trump wanting to meet Putin at the 2013 Miss Universe pageant. And remember how he was like, yeah, maybe he'll be my new best friend. <laughs> yeah, those tweets, they did not age well. No, <laughs> but none of his followers care. Uh, and then we get to the top of page 112. The paragraph begins, The redacted mentioned by Emin Agalarov was Veselnitskaya. Not sure why this descriptor of Veselnitskaya is redacted for grand jury material, but it is. It's weird because the entire paragraph thereafter describes her in detail with no redactions. <laughs> so maybe there's something we don't know about her mm-hmm. because she's like the, the, the stripper, yeah, Veselnitskaya, but that would be for private information. This mm-hmm. is for grand jury material. right? So there's got to be something we don't know about her that's not been publicly reported, right? Because everything else is publicly reported. We know about, they mention, they they describe her in detail. Maybe they determined she officially was an agent of the Russian government or something. They say that earlier in the report, though, that she has ties to Russia. Ties, though, but... Oh, but not an official agent. Yeah, mm. because the whole thing was her saying that she was just a rogue actor. Yeah, but she works for the government under that crown prosecutor guy. I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah, it could be. Maybe uh, the redacted... Mentioned by Emin Ag- Agalarov was Veselnitskaya. What? Sorry, I need to correct myself here, or not correct myself, potentially correct myself. Was she officially there saying, here, I'm here on official Russian business on behalf of the Russian government? I didn't think she said that. No, she didn't say that. Yeah. No, but it, it says that she officially worked for the prosecutor, right. especially when she was right. doing the Prevazon Holdings case. <laughs> the Crown Prosecutor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Crown Prosecutor. <laughs> yeah, definitely had stand. established public ties to the actual Russian government, but for this specifically, she wasn't like, I am here on behalf of Putin. <laughs> no, yeah, and that was easily known, to mm-hmm. her tie, because that was her job, Yeah, uh, was being a prosecutor for the, you know, the prosecutors of, the prosecution office of Russia. I can't, it's, their name is, it's named later. Yeah. So this redacted thing, hmm. Yeah, hmm. weird the ugly vessel net sky. No, I don't know. I don't know what it, don't <laughs> body know what shaming it is. reactions. Yeah. I guess the jury that. and the results are in. <laughs> <laughs> a blind poll says she's actually very good looking. So I don't. Yeah, I really. Is. I mean, in her business, you got you have to be right. Yeah. I oh yeah, imagine. to be a sparrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Oh yes, got to be a honey pot. <laughs> so it says she worked as a prosecutor for the Russian prosecutor's office. Mm-hmm. That's not redacted. She lobbied against the mm-hmm. Magnitsky Act, uh, which Russia responded to by halting the adoptions of Russian children by U.S. Citizens, and that she performed legal work for Denis Katsif, the son of Peter Katsif, a Russian businessman who worked for Prevazon Holdings, 
which was a defendant in a civil forfeiture action alleging the laundering of proceeds from a tax scam. And that's the tax scam that was exposed Mm -hmm. by Browder and Magnitsky that got Magnitsky imprisoned and murdered. And that, you know, is what prompted Browder to go out and lobby and get the Magnitsky Act passed. So something not mentioned here is that Fusion GPS was hired coincidentally by Prevazon to find dirt on Bill Browder, the guy working Mm. with Magnitsky to expose the money laundering. We have an entire episode on the Magnitsky Act and all this drama. It's all the way back. It's episode two, I think, all the way back from December 2017. So check that out uh, if you want to get the full, because he he testified for hours in front of Congress and it was a chilling story about Magnitsky. So Fusion GPS was a firm that was also hired first by Republicans to get oppo research on Trump and then hired by the Clinton campaign, which resulted in the Steele dossier. So weird coincidence. Oh, yeah. Uh, And it is literally just a coincidence. Uh, (laughs) I know the Republicans tried to bring that up a lot in the Fusion GPS and the Bill Browder hearings about Prevazon Holdings and what's your connection? That was one of their tries. Mm -hmm. It's totally just they were they're a spy. They're a for hire spy agency. Exactly. And that's what they do. Politicians They've, need information and intel. Yeah, and they and mostly Fusion GPS does private business stuff. So if you're being sued, you can hire them to find dirt on whoever's suing you so that you can discredit them in court. It's what And it's, it's all legal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah it, it, it his his commodity is information and mm-hmm. everybody wants to buy that shit. Yeah. He doesn't care who it is. It's like they Miss don't Scarlet care who from it is. Clue. I'll yes. sell secrets mm-hmm. and I'll sell them to the highest bidder. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a capitalist. So the footnotes on this page are extensive. They include the Southern District of New York indicting Veselnitskaya with obstruction in the Prevazon litigation, alleging she lied to the court about her relationship to the prosecutor general's office in Russia and her involvement in responding to a U.S. document request sent to the Russian government. She forged documents. Footnote 678 says that when she testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee on November 2017, she said she didn't give Junior any in- info on Clinton. Mm-hmm. And footnote 679 explains who Magnitsky was, that he worked for Browder, who hired him to investigate a corporate tax fraud perpetrated by Russian officials, and that he died in a Russian prison. Browder lobbied Congress, as I said, to then pass mm-hmm. the Magnitsky Act. So then we get to page 113. Mueller explains that shortly after Goldstone called Emin, he emailed Junior. Good morning. Emin just called and asked me to contact you with something very interesting. The Crown Prosecutor of Russia met with his father, <laughs> Eris, this morning. Uh, met with Emin's father, Eris, this morning. And in their meeting, offered to provide the Trump campaign with some official documents and information that would incriminate Hillary and her dealings with Russia and would be very useful to your father. It's obviously very high level and sensitive information because it's totally legal, but Mm -hmm. it's part of Russia and it's government support for Mr. Trump uh, helped along by Aris and Emin. What do you think is the best way to handle this information? And would you be able to speak to Emin about it directly? I can also send this info to your father via Rona, but it is ultra sensitive. So I wanted to send it to you first, meaning knowing that he didn't want Trump to touch this. Right. Mm -hmm. Best. uh, Well, Rob Goldstone Junior pretty much responded immediately to this uh, when Goldstone sent this email, mm-hmm. like within a, three minutes, mm-hmm. with his famous, if it's what you say, I love it email. And then Goldstone told Emin what Junior said. Uh, Emin got back to Goldstone June 6th. So we're three days from the meeting now, asking if there was any news. And Goldstone emailed Junior and asked when he was free to speak to Emin about the Hillary dirt. So the footnotes here consist largely of the emails between Goldstone Junior and Emin. Mm-hmm. Which makes sense. Anyhow, Goldstone arranged the call, and that's pretty much where his involvement sort of ends, but not really. He gets involved again. Uh, and, and this is the setup part of the story. And we, we interviewed him on the show, Goldstone, and he told us he was just the introducer and then bowed out once he put Emin in touch with Junior. Goldstone would be asked to attend the actual meeting, though. So he was mm. there at the meeting, and he was like, I didn't want to go. Um, <laughs> but he was there. Why would he get involved if he didn't want to be involved? Because he's a dude's publicist and it's part of the job, I guess, when you're working mm-hmm. with sketchy people, where, okay. especially in countries where the celebrities are also the oligarchs. Yeah. So Emin and his father, Eris, from the Crocus Group, who's trying to put together these fake deals with Trump Tower in Moscow, trying to get him to, you know, to, cro- to compromise him and have dirt on him uh, and make him an asset, witting or unwitting. Uh, is going to force his emissary, so to speak, his his envoy, Goldstone, to be at the meeting so that he knows everything that happened there. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. my guess. Makes a lot of sense. All right, so top of page 114. That same day, Eris Aguilarov called Kavaladze and asked him to set up a meeting with the Trump org. Kavaladze is a Georgian-born U.S. citizen, not Georgia, U.S., but Georgia mm-hmm. over there, <laughs> who worked for... Uh, I know so many Kavaladzes <laughs> in Georgia. <laughs> That's not <laughs> fair to say. It's a, it's a diverse state. Go it on. It could be Go very on. diverse, <laughs> yes. There might be a lot of... 
Uh, he worked in the U.S. for the Crocus Group uh, and reported to Eris Agalarov. So, so this Kavalatse guy, Eris is his boss. So Kavalatse told Mueller's team that in a second phone call that same day, Agalarov asked him if he knew anything about the Magnitsky Act and sent him a synopsis along with Veselnitskaya's contact info. Kavalatse also told the Office of Special Counsel that Agalarov said the purpose of the meeting was to discuss the Magnitsky Act and asked him to be the translator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, then we get to the awareness of the meeting within the campaign. Underpants, underpants, too. And on, ju- on June 7th, two days before the meeting, and the day after all the emails went back and forth, Goldstone e- butted in again, emailed Junior, and said, Emin asked that I schedule a meeting with you and the Russian attorney, and Junior replied that Manafort Cushion Jr. would attend. Then it says Kafalatse redacted puzzled by the attendees, uh, and then he checked with one of Emin's assistants, Benny Amanoff, who said the purpose of the meeting was for Veselnitskaya to convey negative information on Hillary, though Benny Amanoff said he didn't recall having known or said that. Uh, the redactions looked to be three words and could read that Kavalatse told someone he was puzzled, like Kavalatse told Goldstone he was puzzled, or Kavalatse told Junior or Trump, or I don't know, that he was puzzled about mm-hmm. the attendance. Or Kavalatse and someone were puzzled by the list of attendees, and that name or information is redacted for grand jury uh, material. So mm. the footnotes have a lot of info for that are that's redacted for grand jury uh, stuff, but they appear to be 302s from Kavalatse from November 2017. There's a 302 from Benny Amanoff from January 2018, and then emails between Goldstone, Kavalatse, Trump Jr., and a fourth redacted person. Uh, the Goldstone 302 from February 2018 is also listed as a source for this information. And Benny Amanoff is now wrapped up in this, as he as he was in the 2013 Miss Universe, trying to get Putin and Trump to meet. So these people have been on this for a while. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and it's the same people. And now Mueller's interviewing him. So it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Over to page 115 and, and how on June 8th, Cush emailed his assistant to contact Junior about setting up the meeting. Junior forwarded the entirety of his correspondence to Manafort and Cush with the subject, Russia, Clinton, private, confidential. <laughs> God damn it. Not at all. Totally innocent. Oh, my God. And I wonder if it's, sorry. I wonder if it's stuff like that, though, that makes, that makes Mueller say that he was too dumb. Well, that's what I don't understand. If you're too dumb to know you're committing a crime, why mark it private and confidential? Doesn't that hmm. sound like you know that you're committing a crime? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I guess I, I was thinking that it so sounds like you know that you're committing a crime. You have to be stupid. <laughs> or, <laughs> that. or privileged, right? <laughs> totally. I think you should be punished if privilege is his excuse. But yeah, he could be that dumb. But I'm not convinced. No. I, mean, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not actually convinced. But no. I see your point, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just weird. Private, confidential, Russia, Clinton, sensitive information. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, it's like you want the information to get out if it's dirt, right? So I guess, yeah, the private and confidential part could only be in reference to the setting up of the meeting To itself. our communications. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think you knew. Well, they set up the meeting for 4 p.m. June 9th, the next day. Hey, guys, I'm here to sing the praises of Third Love. I am officially obsessed with these bras. Third Love is the only place I get my bras ever since I fell in love with my first one. Not only are they co-owned by a woman, and not only do they show real women with wrinkles and rolls and piercings and tattoos in their ads, and not only are they disrupting the male-dominated bra industry in the best way possible, but their bras are seriously the most comfortable bras and the most perfect fitting bras I've ever owned. And that's because they use an easy fit finder quiz to find your perfect fit. And they use metadata, millions of measurements from real women. They don't just consider your number and your letter. They take into account issues you have with off-the-rack bras like digging straps and cup spillage. But they consider cup shape, and that's the most important thing. And they're the industry leader right now with over 70 sizes. It's so easy to use. Just pop online, take their 60-second fit finder quiz. They help you identify your breast size and shape. And they have half sizes because 50% of women who identify and people who identify as women fall in between cup sizes. And I'm one of those people. So I could never get the perfect fitting bra until Third Love made it possible. They have 100% fit guarantee as well. And you have 60 days to wear it. You can wash it. You can put it to the test. And if it's not perfect, just return it. And here's the coolest thing ever. Third Love will wash it and donate it to a woman in need. And returns and exchanges are always free and easy. It's the most comfortable bra uh, I've ever had. Totally breathable fabrics, lightweight materials, straps that don't dig or slip, and they're tagless. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone, so right now they're offering our listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash report now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash report for 15% off today. You'll be glad you did. 
So Gates told the office, uh, the office, which is Mueller, that Junior announced the meeting at a regular staff meeting, saying he had <laughs> had a lead on Hillary Dirt, <laughs> private and confidential. Oh uh, Gates believed Junior said the Dirt was coming from a group in Kyrgyzstan and recalled the meeting was attended by Junior, Eric Manafort, Hicks, Ivanka, and Jared. He also said Manafort warned the group that the meeting would not would likely not yield vital information, so they should be careful. Uh, Hicks denies knowledge of the meeting, and Cush didn't recall if the meeting was announced at all. Cohen, though, recalled being in Trump's office on June 6th or 7th when Junior told his father about the meeting and that it could result in getting negative dirt on Hillary. Although Cohen did not recall uh, Junior stating the meeting was connected to Russia, but said it seemed like Junior and Trump had discussed the meeting previously, though Cohen wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Junior denied he told his father, and the footnotes here on the emails mentioned in 302s from Gates, Hicks, Cush, and Cohen. That's where they're getting this information from. Okay. Then page 116 continues with Manafort and Kush not recalling informing Trump of the meeting. And Trump stated in his written answers to Mueller, I had no recollection of learning it at the time. (laughs) Footnotes here mention 302s with Manafort. Junior's testimony to the Senate Judiciary that Mueller reminds us he was not under oath for, but lying to Congress is a crime. Interesting reminder. Mm -hmm. Makes me think of ongoing uh, and open stuff. And the written response of uh, Trump to question one parts A through C. In the footnote, Mueller says he considered Trump's speech. Uh, where he teased a major announcement about Hillary before the meeting. And then when the office didn't find evidence, uh, well, the office didn't find evidence that the idea for the speech was connected to the June 9th meeting. Mm -hmm. So we can assume, but there was no documentary evidence of it. Yeah. Or they couldn't find it. God damn, that would be such an important piece. Mm -hmm. And they also, um, there was a lack of speech Monday when they didn't get the dirt. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mueller says he considered that. Did right before said a big announcement right after no big announcement Mm -hmm. because no dirt happened Mm -hmm. and he couldn't get that linchpin piece and so when Mueller says we you know we didn't have the evidence to uh, prove a broader conspiracy that would have been a keystone piece of evidence yeah but then if they didn't wind up getting the information anyway even if you can prove that he intended to accept an in-kind campaign (laughs) contribution (laughs) contribution it doesn't even matter right what do you mean if they don't actually get the dirt, even if they can prove that Trump was willing and open to accept it and was teasing it, it, it does it like, what does that even matter? It does because you, you're conspired to get it. And that itself could. But yeah. then you don't have to get the information in order for it to be a crime. It seems like there's instances of that, though, throughout all of this. That's what Mueller is trying to say to us. Right. Yeah. He's saying he's a by the book guy in the sense that his hands are tied so much that he if he doesn't link it completely, he can't charge. But Congress can. Yeah. But he never lays out any sort of conspiracy charges. So in a sense, the obstruction of justice. Well, that's different. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. And he can't. Different. You're right. Because he's missing that key piece of information. So he can't even go near it. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. he's ultra conservative. We have to remember, he's like bends over backwards to give Trump a break. Yeah. yeah. That's why he got the job and mm-hmm. Trump still hates him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. that is one of the things that I struggle with is, is just the fact that conspiracy to commit a crime is a crime in itself. But then it wasn't listed as anything that was even going to be looked at, like you said, because there wasn't that other piece of evidence that could even get the ball rolling on that. But it's just weird. Or he did all the investigation and couldn't find that last key piece to charge him. Yeah. Right. And then he can't even say that. Then he has to exonerate him on conspiracy, a broader conspiracy. Yeah. And I feel like in like a normal criminal case, like with a, I guess, less privileged person, they would be seen amongst like a peer, right? Like, you know, like a jury. And so that's what we're trying to do is get Trump among like peers to be like, hey, we think he did this, even though you can't do anything about it. And that's kind of what Congress is supposed to be in this case, right? Yes. Congress's job to, quote unquote, indict him on these crimes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when he says, going back to when he notes that Donald Trump Jr. lying to Congress is in fact a crime, even though he was not under oath, it makes me wonder if Mueller has some sort of subtext throughout the entire report, which is pointing out to Congress all the points at which people could and maybe should be charged with things, but there are things that currently exist that forbids people from doing that, or at least not forbids, but the precedent is to not do that. So like saying that you need to make a criminal referral when someone lies to Congress, Mm -hmm. or like the OLC opinion, for example, these barriers that sort of exist that stop justice, basically. Yeah, and, and there might be things that, like the OLC opinion that exists that I don't know about that prevented him from charging Trump Jr. with lying to Congress or yeah. Congress has to make the referral. Um, but 
because he didn't lie to him. He didn't lie to Mueller, but he lied to Congress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I think Mueller's testifying. I feel like he knows that, you know, he didn't want to do it, but now he has to because people are not. I don't. Yeah, I don't know if that's the case because he doesn't want to testify at all. You think he's being cornered? I think. Yeah, he's definitely being. I I thought he had a choice. Okay. No. Okay. Not with a subpoena. Got it. I hope someone asks him that stuff like that. You mentioned this in the report. Why did you do that? Yeah, because this is precisely the kind of thing that is a crime that he can't prosecute because he he didn't lie to him. He lied to Congress. Mm -hmm. So that's why he's like, hey, right here, he uh, wasn't under oath, but he lied to Congress. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of like a little red flag. So (laughs) lots of those throughout this. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) When we get to the events of June 9th. Um, on this next page here, uh, 2016, beginning with Veselnitskaya being in New York for an appellate proceeding in the Prevazon case. Ah, two birds. <laughs> and then she called. Great for the budget. <laughs> two sparrows with one stone. Uh, that day she called Akhmenshin, a Soviet-born U.S. lobbyist. And uh, there's a few words redacted for grand jury purposes. And then when she learned that he was in New York, she invited him to lunch. Akhmenshin told the office he was working on stuff related to the Magnitsky Act and the Prevazon litigation. And that he, Kapalatse, and a guy named Samachornov also attended the lunch. Veselnitskaya told them she was meeting with redacted and asked Akhmenshin what she should tell him. So why was it redacted? I don't know. And I don't know who it is uh, because we know she met with Junior. We know she met with Manafort and Kush. Did was somebody else at that meeting? Is it that fourth person in that email chain that was redacted? Is it who Kavalatse said, this is weird. Why, you know, these people are attending the meeting when he saw the attendance list. Who mm-hmm. else was at the meeting that we don't know about? Is it, or is that even it? Maybe she was running her mouth and she said something like Trump. Yeah. And then they redacted it for the whatever that is, the... What is it? Honor? Privacy. Yeah. Honor. <laughs> yes. But it's but it's redacted for grand jury. So Oh, that's what I was asking. Okay, so it's yeah. redacted. Okay, mm-hmm. got it. Uh, so she asked Ak mentioned what she should tell him. So it's a dude, whoever it is. Uh, or, you know, someone who identifies as such. Uh, the redaction bar, you know, all those trans men hanging out in the Trump team. Yeah, the oh, Republican. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just swarm in the place. Super, super open with that stuff. Yeah, just very secure with their own gender identity. <laughs> yeah, clearly. Oh, but here I've even noted the redaction bar is too long to be one name. So maybe uh, it must list a person and the reason for the meeting or under what auspices they were meeting. Like she told Ock mentioned she was meeting with Trump Jr. to discuss dirt on Hillary mm-hmm. and asked what she should tell him. Huh. That would be interesting. Oh, um, yeah. Just a guess. Uh, according to several attendees of the lunch, she showed Ock mentioned a document alleging financial misconduct by Bill Browder and the Ziff brothers making donations to the DNC. So she did have dirt. Um, then there's uh, a redacted sentence for grand jury reason. The footnotes reference 302s from Ock mentioned, uh, Sam Chornoff, Kavalatse, and Goldstone. Uh, and there's a footnote that says uh, Sam Chornoff did not recall the planned subject matter of the meeting. Uh, and that in Veselnitskaya's la- later Senate statement, she produced what she claimed were talking points that she brought to the meeting. So that's weird. Mm-hmm. And then they all went up to the meeting. Junior Manafort, Kush, Kovalatse, Samar Charnoff, Akhmenshin, Veselnitskaya, and Goldstone were there. The meeting lasted all of 20 minutes. Participants agreed that she was that she kicked it off with the Ziff brothers, saying that they had broken Russian laws and donated their profits to the DNC or Clinton, and that they were ill-gotten through money laundering. And I want to remind everyone here that Attorney General Bill Barr has worked with the Ziff brothers in the past. <laughs> and for me, that's one of uh, a few reasons Barr should have totally recused himself from oversight of the Mueller probe. <laughs> yeah. Barr also worked with Howard Lorber, one of three blocked calls for the Trump Jr. the day of June 9th. Uh, Barr also had about has about two hundred fifty thousand dollars invested in Deutsche Bank, and he repped Alpha Bank, uh, the bank that Van der Swan's father-in-law helped run. And as we know, Van der Swan was indicted by Mueller. How he's allowed to, over, to oversee this case is beyond me. It's yeah, just who, beyond. I me. guess because Trump is the person who chooses, right? No, no one else was in charge of Barr being appointed, right? No one else had authority. I it, assume it doesn't matter who's appointed. Like Sessions recused himself, and, and Trump yeah. appointed oh, him. Like Barr doesn't have honor. Even <laughs> even right. Sessions has a little racist possum. It's a little yeah. bit of honor in there. <laughs> yeah. Or would they take, um, I guess maybe at that point, that's when a Richard Painter-like figure would come in and talk to Trump and set him straight, maybe. Or would it be more of a role of, of the inspector general that would do a more thorough? Well, like, it's always up to the person. So it's up to Bill Barr whether he recuses or not. Mm-hmm. And he might have been told by an ethics panel that he needed to recuse himself, and he may have ignored it. In fact, when they asked him if he, if an ethics panel asked to, told him to recuse, he refused to talk about it. Mm-hmm. So 
it sounds to me like somebody said you have to recuse yourself. There's yeah. four giant conflicts of interest here, and none of them are golf fee disputes. Right. Yeah. So you really got to take yourself off of this case. And he went, nah. Golf. Yeah, because that's why he was there. Because totally. of that was his resume for Trump. <laughs> Those right. four like, and, cases. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And having conflicts of interest isn't a crime, so it's not something that could be officially investigated. Like exactly. You're saying. Yeah. And then also knowing what happened to Sessions when he recused himself. Mm-hmm. Trump turned on him. Yeah. Big so, time. <laughs> why would you even? Yeah. Why wouldn't have hired him? So he probably gave Trump some sort of guarantee he wouldn't recuse himself, which his sessions didn't give him. Right. So here we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So There's a little red flag there. I think a lot of little red flags makes for one big red flag, right? One like- big red Russian flag. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Akhmeshin tried to save the meeting. Uh, well, Veselitskaya, first of all, she brings up the Ziff brothers, right? Um, and they engaged in tax evasion and money laundering in the U.S. and Russia, according to her, although they've never been charged with that here. Uh, then there's a redacted sentence. And then Akhmeshin told the office, Mueller, that Junior asked if she could tie the payments, if Junior asked if Veselnitskaya could tie the payments directly to Clinton. And she said no, at which point Kush just got pissy, saying, what are we even doing here? <laughs> they, so they wanted dirt on Hillary. They expected it. They were mad when they didn't get it. And later in volume one, like I said, we'll cover exactly why Mueller says this is not a crime. Uh, so we'll, we'll go over that. Akhmetchen tried to save the meeting, as I was as saying, by pitching Trump could repeal Magnitsky and appeal to U.S. Christians who want to adopt Russian babies. But it was too late. Kush had already sent a message to Manafort, saying, who's sitting across from him, saying, waste of time. And then he emailed two people from Kush companies asking them to call him to give him an excuse to leave, which I've used during Bumble dates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't blame him for that one. <laughs> <laughs> like, give him the high sign and somebody comes over and says, I need to talk to you immediately. Yeah. Yeah. If you got Kushner on Bumble, that'd be a... Well, no. you get to swipe. So that's, yeah, it's mm. how the women are empowered. Swipe down. <laughs> so uh, Kush left the meeting early, right? And then there's a whole big paragraph about inconsistencies in Veselnitskaya's statements and interviews, but no explanation yet about why she wasn't charged in this case. Mm-hmm. Mm. Then I had her on my... Sorry. Go ahead. I had her on my fantasy indictment league and it did not prove to be fruitful. And I'm wondering why not? Yeah, mm-hmm. me too. Mm-hmm. Unless it's still open and ongoing. Mm-hmm. Uh, then there's a paragraph about Junior's inconsistent statements to the press and Congress, but again, no explanation or mention of why he was not charged with lying. And then the final section here, being on page 120, covers the post meeting events, including Veselnitskaya and Eris Agalarov making unsuccessful attempts to reach out to Trump about the Magnitsky Act after the election, as well as Kafalatse emailing Goldstone after the election about setting up another meeting with the tea people, quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> Mueller didn't identify evidence of the transition team following up. Mueller mm-hmm. didn't identify evidence. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, I mean, at that point, it would be illogical for them to follow up because mm-hmm. they didn't give him anything. Right. And they're Unless there was gonna, something else. They're ob- yeah. <laughs> and they're obviously going to still try to infiltrate the transition and, and the presidency. Yeah. That's just how Russia goes, no matter who's in the office. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, it'd be good if you called the FBI. <laughs> yeah. Always. <laughs> For everything we talk about, Always you should have called the FBI. <laughs> yeah. So uh, around June 2017, the attendees started getting questions a year later from their attorneys about the meeting. And, and the June 9th meeting became public following the following month, the, the news of it. And on July 9th, in a text message to Emin, Goldstone wrote, I made sure I kept you and your father out of this story. And if contacted, I can do a dance and keep you out of it. Wow. Please don't dance. <laughs> uh, he added, quote, FBI now investigating, and I hope this favor was worth was worth for your dad. It could blow up. On July 12th, Emin complained to Kavaladze that his father never listens, and their relationship with Mr. T has been thrown down the drain. <laughs> and on aug- in August, Goldstone told Emin that the publicity about the dumb meeting has destroyed his reputation. <laughs> He's pretty mad. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, but he, he shows cognizance that he knew that it was bad, <clears throat> that he, he said it was a big favor, so... Exactly. Mm-hmm. Must know that you were in some sort of peril. Yeah, high level, confidential. I, I, I don't want to send it directly to Trump because I don't want to yeah. connect him to it yet. That's why I'm sending it to you. <laughs> yeah. What exactly did he? I'm trying to remember what his exact explanation was. He when he was on our podcast, he said something like, you know, he tried to flippantly sort of explain it away. Like, yeah, he was just like, well, you know, I'm friends with Emin. I work with Emin, and Emin knows Junior, and they wanted to get together because someone had dirt on somebody. I just set the meeting up. Totally, I, you know, I'm casino hands in this i don't have 
anything. Yeah, I think that's it. disingenuous yeah. slightly. I know he seemed like I don't think he's like a horrible guy or anything, but no. I definitely think Super he friendly. failed. Yeah, very friendly, but he did fail to insert the sentiment that he knew yeah. that that was not a good idea potentially. Yeah, because afterwards he said, "This is so. This is dumb. Meetings wrecked my life. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm keeping you out of it, doing a dance. You know. And yeah, you, you knew, bro. Unless maybe he didn't know until later, and he's just playing that up to make himself seem more valuable for his employer. Right. Or no one googled in those three days before the meeting, like if it's legal to do this. No. Or like, yeah. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. So that, weird. That, that would would re- require an email to an assistant exactly. to a fax machine. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just too much. Got it. Got Have it. you ever tried to Google something from a fax machine? It's weird. <laughs> so then after the public found out about the meeting, uh, the Trump org again reached out to uh, meeting attendees. And on July 10th, Fooderfoss sent Goldstone an email with a proposed statement for him to make. The email, the proposed statement he sent said, as the person who arranged the meeting, I can definitely state... Uh, that the statement I read by Junior, the statements by Junior are 100% accurate. The meeting was a complete waste of time, and Don was never told Veselnitskaya's name prior to the meeting. She talked about the Magnitsky Act and Russian adoption laws. There was never any follow-up, and nothing ever came of it. That's what Fooderfoss, who I think is a Trump org lawyer, Mm -hmm. wanted Goldstone to say. Uh, Then there's this sentence. Redacted, the statement drafted by Trump organization representatives was redacted. Hmm. He proposed a different statement. To me, this actually says Goldstone said the statement drafted by the Trump org representatives was not accurate. <laughs> and that's why he proposed a different statement. It just yeah. makes sense in that in that context. Those redactions are grand jury related. And I question them because they make Trump and Junior look bad. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm wondering if Barr just. I was going to say Barr is the one with the Sharpie in this case. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. The Barr. The Barpie. And, <laughs> the he, barpie. and he removed this probably because uh, Goldstone said. This bullshit statement that Fooderfoss from the Trump org sent me isn't accurate. Here's more, a more accurate statement. Mm-hmm. Um, so he he proposed a different statement. Those redactions, like I said, grand jury material. So it's just weird. Just a blanket statement at this point. Now, I thought grand jury actually would mean something, but it sounds like because Barr was doing this, that it's just an excuse. Yeah, totally. That's what I think. It's, it just makes Trump and Jr. look bad. Mm-hmm. So presumably Goldstone then said the statement should be that... Uh, he had been asked by his client, Emin Agalarov, to facilitate a meeting between a Russian attorney and Trump Jr. The lawyer had apparently stated she had some information regarding funding uh, to the DNC from Russia, which she believed Jr. would find interesting. Then it says Goldstone never released either statement, confirming it was Goldstone that objected to Fudor Foss's bullshit statement. And so mm-hmm. well, I don't know why it was redacted. Yeah. Because Goldstone didn't release either statement means it was Goldstone. And why so, is the other one not redacted in that case, it's, right? It's yeah. just weird. Very strange. So why wasn't Fuderfoss charged with witness tampering? I don't get. Mm. Uh, Mueller says that uh, interactions between Trump and Jr. and others in June and July 2017 regarding the meeting will be addressed in volume two. Ooh, to be continued. <laughs> witness tampering. I thought you could only be charged for witness tampering after a charge is already on the table. Mm. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. So he's not a, a witness in a case. He's Yet. just Goldstone. Yeah. At this point. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. But he maybe he's trying to, sub- he can't even subordin perjury because he's not a witness in a case. That's a good point. Damn. Yeah. We need more cases. He's just <laughs> a dude. It's just a lawyer telling somebody what to say at that point. Yeah. I think so. But the way but it's all know. rolling out, it's so sketch. Yeah. But it yeah. sure does show a consciousness of guilt. Absolutely. <laughs> and if there ever is a charge, which I hope there is, then I, I hope that counts for something. <clears throat> yeah. And, and it, I, I don't think it wouldn't be in here if it weren't somehow important, mm-hmm. especially with redactions to grand jury material. Yeah. So. Finally, uh, Sam Acharnoff said the organization that hired him to lobby against the Magnitsky Act offered him $90,000 to cover his legal fees if he made statements consistent with Veselnitskaya's, but he declined, saying he didn't want to perjure himself. <laughs> oh, what a smart so dude. why is Veselnitskaya not charged? It's just weird. Yeah. yeah. All right, on to the next section. This covers the Republican National Convention, before and after and leading up to... Uh, and if you recall, when we, we covered this during the podcast and during some of our book reviews of Russian Roulette, there appeared to be suspicious connections surrounding Manafort along uh, with how the Republican platform language was changed to ease the language against Russian activity in Ukraine, Russian aggression. Uh, we're, we're on page 123 now, and we begin with the introduction that states Trump campaign officials met with Kislyak during the week of the Republican National Convention. Mueller states that the evidence indicates uh, the interactions were brief and non-substantive. But during the platform committee, and, he, and see, here's where he's saying the evidence says they were non-substantive. Exactly. Very he's not particular. saying there wasn't evidence, mm-hmm. right? It's different. Um, so I just find that just fascinating. Yeah. It's also him not saying that there was not sufficient evidence 
So it's it's kind of him making a judgment saying that he had evidence and it amounted to nothing. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so, but, but during the platform committee meetings, um, uh, J.D. Gordon and a senior campaign advisor on policy watered down an amendment expressing support for lethal assistance to Ukraine in response to Russian aggression. Gordon wanted lethal changed to appropriate. Hmm. And the woman that sponsored the lethal language, a Republican, mind you, that I believe is named Diana Denman, uh, from our previous reporting, told Mueller that Gordon told her he was on the phone with Trump who wanted to change the language. Holy shit. Uh, Gordon denies telling her that. <laughs> <laughs> but the investigation did not establish Gordon spoke to or was directed by Trump to change the language. So Gordon was just puffing his chest out. I'm on the phone with Trump. We ought to change it. Oh, I've seen people do that lie before. Yeah. I'm on the phone with the president. Yeah. <laughs> Gordon told the office he made the changes because he felt it was just aligned with the candidate's position on Ukraine. So he backed down when and when had had when he had to talk to Mueller about mm-hmm. it. So then we get the details. First about the interactions with Kislyak, Gordon, and Sessions. Mueller says the week before the RNC in July 2016, about 80 ambassadors to the U.S., including Kislyak, were invited to a Heritage Foundation conference yes. co-sponsored by the State Department where Gordon and Sessions gave speeches. Uh, Gordon said in his speech that the U.S. should have better relations with Russia. During Sessions' speech, he took questions, uh, and it's believed he took questions from, or he took one from Kislyak. And when they finished the speeches, they met and shook hands uh, with the ambassadors, including Kislyak, who shook hands with Sessions and told him, I meant what I said in my speech. <laughs> Although Sessions stated during uh, interviews with the office that he didn't recall meeting or speaking with Kislyak, he believed the two spoke briefly, maybe, about <laughs> Russia-U.S. relations. Or whatever, possums, talk about trash, you know, talk trash. Yep. Yeah, wait, so which is it? He doesn't recall speaking to him, or maybe they did speak briefly about Russia. He doesn't US. recall speaking to them, meaning like for any like having a meeting. But mm. he did say that he meant like met him in passing, met him in passing, and they might have talked talked about U.S. Right. Russia, which is such an easy excuse. It's like believable in, to a degree, but it pisses me off coming from him. But he did just give a speech about U.S. Russia relations, so mm. it's feasible that he shook his hand and said, "I meant what I said." U.S. Russia relations, we got to improve them, and yeah, then walked yeah. on. I can see that. Yeah, so this one I actually kind of maybe buy that they didn't have a substantial or substantive meeting. And later during a reception that night, later that night, (laughs) in a dark and stormy night, Gordon sat and ate with Kislyak (laughs) and said he may have discussed Russia with him briefly. Hmm. Uh, Carter Page was at the table along with the ambassadors of Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, by the way, is where Trump built that tower that was built by, uh, that was totally like mired in uh, money laundering and, and... of terrorist money and the what the Iranian Revolutionary Guard was involved. Jeez and, Louise. Yeah, real bad. Bad news. So Section B goes on into the details about the party platform change where the Trump campaign team discussed toning down the language from the 2012 platform that identified Russia as Ukraine's number one threat uh, given Trump's desire to have better relations with Russia. The RNC Platform Committee sent the draft platform to the National Security and Defense Platform Subcommittee on July 10th, 2016, the night before the first meeting to discuss amendments to the 2012 platform. Uh, the rules for platform changes uh, are that only delegates can make changes. There's delegates at the convention, like Diana Denman. Mm-hmm. But the Trump campaign members can make recommendations and request changes, and they attended the committee meetings to do that. John Mashburn... Hello, was Mm -hmm. the Trump campaign's policy director and helped oversee the campaign's involvement in those meetings. He instructed Gordon and other committee members to be hands off unless something in the platform contradicted Trump's policy positions. Mm. Don't make changes, he said. So during these meetings, Delegate Diana Denman, ding, ding, there she is, mentioned in the report. I was right. Yay. (laughs) Uh, She submitted uh, an amendment proposal that the platform provide for armed support. Uh, for Ukraine and announced support for maintaining and possibly ratcheting up Russian sanctions until the U- uh, until Ukraine's so- uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity were fully restored. And she added that she wanted to provide lethal defensive weapons to Ukraine's armed forces and increase coordination with NATO on defense planning. <laughs> I, mean, I like her. <laughs> yeah, Trump's ears started bleeding. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, we have a woman recommending Russian <laughs> sanctions, <laughs> lethal support for Ukraine against Russian aggression, and increased NATO cooperation. <laughs> it's <laughs> Hillary all over again. <laughs> Pretty much everything Trump hates, right? <laughs> so Gordon told Mueller he flagged the amendment. That's what Gordon told Mueller. Okay. And when it was proposed, Gordon and Matt Miller moved, that's another guy from the policy team. Mm-hmm. Trump's not Matthew policy. Miller. No. Right. No. And not, not friend Mac of Miller. The I mean, I guess he is Matthew Miller, but... He might be, but it's different. Not guy. our Matthew Miller. Right, right. right. Not cute Kush. No. <laughs> Good Kush, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, they moved to table the amendment, Diane Denman's amendment, for further discussion. Now, all this information, according to the footnotes, came from 302s from Gordon, Sessions, Denman, Hoff, 
Mashburn, and Manafort. None of it's redacted. So none of it's ongoing elsewhere. So I think the RNC platform change is pretty much a dead issue. Yeah. Uh, Thus begins the back and forth with Gordon and Miller and Denman. Uh, She said no. Uh, She says Gordon told her he was on the phone with New York, meaning the president. She didn't believe him. (laughs) The whole state of New York. (laughs) I didn't believe him. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, are people just brandishing him? (laughs) (laughs) Gordon says, I never told her that. Uh, And he was going by his knowledge of Trump's policy preference on Russia and how he wanted Europe to deal with Ukraine. And the U.S. and Russia should be buddies. Right. Hmm. I just knew this. I didn't tell her I was on the phone with Trump, but he totally said that. And she was like, I don't believe you. (laughs) Gordon's phone records show a call to Sessions in D.C., but not to New York or Trump. So Mm -hmm. Trump says, uh, so, I mean, it's good that uh, that Mueller followed up on that. Exactly. He got to verify those claims. And we learned that this guy's a piece of shit that lies about being on the phone with Trump. It happens a lot. Yeah. Like when uh, Corsi said it was his tweets that got the WikiLeaks stuff released. Oh, my goodness. And uh, and Mueller's like, you know, there's no tweets. They're always taking credit (laughs) for things that they had nothing to do with. Yeah. Yeah. I'm experiencing some frustration reading this and learning all of how so, this amounts to not a lot because when this all came out it was totally written with people saying stuff like that like they had talked to trump and it's frustrating to me that they're just like lying like that mm-hmm. they're just lying liars yeah. yes well th- yeah it just it just sucks i mean obviously ultimately for our democracy it's better for those crimes to have not been committed than for them to have and i'm not reveling in that right but, it's, but they're it's, so it's, comfortable lying that that's concerning in itself yeah yeah, exactly. It's, and, and, and it's just gross, you know. Mm-hmm. Ooh, Trump on the phone. It is. Well, and it's also like a huge waste of our fucking government resources. Oh, too. yeah. You're creating all of these like false trails, basically. Yeah. That, but, they, but this is the kind of shit, this is the kind of work product Mueller does. He follows up every little stupid thing. Yeah. yeah. I wish he were around all the time. And then, then they're not all stupid. Yeah, we need a permanent special counsel. Um, <laughs> yeah. So Gordon told the office he tried to reach out to Dearborn. Uh, that's Mashburn's pal. And senior foreign policy advisor, he tried to reach Mashburn as well, the campaign policy director. Gordon said he connected with both of them and told them about the language he took issue with. And both of them were on team appropriate measures uh, instead of lethal. And uh, they were against the lethal language. Dearborn and Mashburn remember Gordon reaching out but said uh, Trump had not taken a stance on the issue and the campaign should not intervene. So that's a difference in uh, opinions, Mm -hmm. a.k.a. facts. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) So when... When Denman's amendment came up in the subcommittee, Gordon changed the language to appropriate assistance and told Mueller, to his recollection, that was the only change they made. Sam Clovis said he was surprised by the change and didn't think it was in in alignment with Trump's views. Hmm. So Mashburn, Dearborn, Clovis, everyone's like, who's doing this? I think it's Manafort by Russia. Oh, Eh? That would make a whole lot of sense. Because eh? yes. Manafort's here. <laughs> oh, he's in that bitch, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that could be an ongoing thing. So, um, yeah, they, they were surprised. Everyone was surprised. Were you surprised? I was surprised. <laughs> Mashburn told the office when he saw that change, he felt Gordon violated Mashburn's directive not to change the language. Uh, and that's part six of section four in volume one. And next week we cover the last two parts, uh, seven and eight. The post-convention contacts with Kislyak, so a little more uh, RNC action. And Paul Manafort. Mm -hmm. It's juicy. It's all juicy. But I I really appreciate this review. It's like all these things we've talked about for two years now are so solidified in this context. It's easy to follow. Yeah. It's a lot of shit. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm glad we're doing this. Totally. Yeah. And just because these things that were huge headlines before as potential crimes are turning out to not have sufficient evidence, it doesn't mean that there wasn't other quid pro quos going on behind the scenes. For right, all the counterintelligence. Sanctions and all, yeah, and all of that stuff. And that's all counterintelligence that he didn't include in his report. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, the, yeah. So class for next week, read pages 127 <laughs> through 144. Mm-hmm. Yes. I do Post. feel like we're kind of a, like, you know, a classic, a, a college course for yeah, the Mueller investigation. Little, yeah. yeah. A little lecture Professor with swears. Professor AG. Yeah. <laughs> lecture with swears. <laughs> How much do you think Trump even like, like the purpose of a party platform, right? How much of a role does that even play outside of pre-election things? Yeah. Right? Right. Because they just want to be in power. Mm-hmm. They're not going to give a fuck. Whatever they can do to yeah. be in power. They're and not going to be like. That's why I think it's sneaky Manafort shit. Exactly. Yeah. Like Manafort is the only other guy who was here that's not mentioned in this part of it 
who was at those meetings, who may have forced Gordon to make these changes in the platform on behalf of Russia. Yeah. In order to help pay back their yeah, absolutely. He was that guy. He was so anti-Ukraine. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and and he because he was pro Yanukovych. Mm-hmm. That yep. is block. Uh, what was it, opposition yeah. block? Anti anti Ukraine being on their own. <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. Anti Ukraine having nice people in charge. Yeah. Exactly. All right, guys. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks for supporting. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you know anybody who needs to read the Mueller report and doesn't have time to sit down and read it, send them this. You get on the treadmill. Each each episode burns like 600 calories. <laughs> uh, and that, that's like four glasses of wine. Very so nice. It's very it's a very good trade off. So you get the report, you get the information, you get to have wine at zero calorie net. I love it. Uh, so that's my uh, recommendation. Yeah, we need a wine yeah. sponsor for this, man. Yeah. Dude, I'm so surprised that has not happened yet. We have had Brewmate... Yes. Which is wine holders. Shout out to Brumet. And we have had people send us a lot of wine. That's that is true. very true. Thank you. That's our favorite. All delicious. <laughs> so delicious. Uh, it was gone immediately. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh Thank you. <laughs> yes, we, we never get sick of that for no, sure. No, we don't. <laughs> um so anyway, again, join us next Thursday for part seven. Okay, and uh, we'll be around. And then, of course, if you are a patron, you can listen to our daily updates called The Daily Beans. They come out on our Patreon page, Patreon at uh, slash Muller She Wrote, Patreon.com slash Muller She Wrote. Uh, and then, of course, we ha- we're always on the road. We have live events. Check out MullerSheWrote.com if we're coming to a city near you. <laughs> and um, it's always that's always a joy. And then, of course, our main Muller She Wrote episode comes out Sunday. We don't do a lot at all. <laughs> no, yeah, no. Thinking about it. Netflix mostly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, Netflix and chill. Yeah. <laughs> Muller and chill. Okay. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. I've been AG. I've been Jaleesa Johnson. I've been Jordan Coburn. And this is Muller She Wrote. Muller She Wrote is produced and engineered by AG with editing and logo design by Jaleesa Johnson. Our marketing consultant and social media manager is Sarah Lee Steiner, and our subscriber and communications director is Jordan Coburn. Fact-checking and research by AG, and research assistance by Jaleesa Johnson and Jordan Coburn. Our merchandising managers are Sarah Lee Steiner and Sarah Hirschberger Valencia. Our web design and branding are by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios, and our website is MullerSheWrote.com. 